Today I want to share with you how to make a lemon ginger turmeric tea ice cubes, an anti-inflammatory drink to serve cold or hot. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I release a new video. Now I just want to take a minute to share with you why we're turning these into ice cubes and what are the benefits offered by ginger, turmeric, and lemons. But if you just want to jump ahead and start making the ice cubes, be sure to check the timestamps in the description below. Now why are we making this tea in the form of ice cubes? There are a number of reasons. Number one, it's very easy to pull them out of the freezer, drop them into a glass, add a little bit of water or sparkling water, whatever you like, a little bit of sweetener, and stir it up and you have a wonderful refreshing beverage that's so nice after you've maybe been working out in the garden or if you want to serve as a mocktail, something that's like a cocktail but without any alcohol to guests during a barbecue. It's just a very handy thing to have already prepared so that you don't need to do this right when you want to enjoy your beverage. And the second reason is if you want to turn this into a hot beverage, all you do is pull the ice cubes out of the freezer, put them in your teacup or in your mug or in your teapot, pour over some hot water, the ice cubes will melt, they'll create this wonderful anti-inflammatory tea, and it'll be the perfect temperature to enjoy. And these ice cubes, when turned into tea, whether it's iced tea or hot tea, are more than just an anti-inflammatory beverage. Ginger contains antiviral properties, antibacterial properties, and antimicrobial properties. So along with being anti-inflammatory, it really offers a lot of benefits to help you. And turmeric really is the jewel in the crown when it comes to creating an anti-inflammatory beverage. And the lemons, well, they offer a lot of vitamin C. So having these ice cubes in your freezer and ready to turn into hot tea during cold and flu season is a wonderful thing to have at the ready because whenever we feel under the weather, the last thing we feel like doing is having to get into a preparation of something. Being able to just pull it out and create your cup of tea is perfect. Now iced teas, or hot teas for that matter, made with ingredients like ginger and turmeric and lemon can be very soothing whenever we feel a little under the weather or maybe have some aches and pains. But certainly, if you have any serious problem, you definitely want to check with your healthcare professional to get the proper care that you need. Now I know one of the first questions I'm going to get is can you make these ice cubes with dry spices as opposed to the fresh ginger and the fresh turmeric? And the answer is yes. And when we go through this process, I'll explain to you how much of the dry spices you're going to need to replace these fresh ingredients. And be sure to check the description underneath this video where I'll have a link to the recipe and instructions for making this over on my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel. Alrighty, well let's start making these ice cubes and go over the ingredients that we're going to need. Now, the first thing that you're going to need if you're using the fresh ginger is approximately a pound of fresh ginger. And this is exactly just about a pound and this is kind of exactly what it looks like. Now, if you grow fresh ginger, you're all set. But if you're going to be buying this at the grocery store, sometimes in the produce section, they'll sell in a plastic clamshell approximately one pound of ginger already picked for you. Uh, if not, it's just a big bin, say, of the fresh ginger. Just pick what looks like approximately a pound and you can even weigh it because they're usually all scale. There are scales all over uh, the grocery store produce section. And then over time, you're going to get a feel for what a pound of ginger looks like. Now, I was actually able to get some fresh turmeric at my local grocery store. It's actually a little under a half a pound, but technically for the proper recipe, it is a pound of ginger and a half a pound of fresh turmeric. And the same thing applies to fresh turmeric 
as it does fresh ginger. Sometimes this is sold in one of those little plastic clamshells already picked for you. Sometimes it's just in a big bin, but either way, you'll start to get a feel for what approximately a half a pound of fresh turmeric looks like. Now, what about if you're not using fresh? If you're not using fresh, and I wrote this down on a piece of paper for me so I would say this correctly, because sometimes I'll get mixed up with tablespoons and teaspoons and whatnot, and I want to make sure that I have this right for you, and it'll definitely all be in the printable recipe over on my website. But if you're not going to be using fresh ginger and you're going to use the powdered or the ground ginger, you're going to want to use one and a half tablespoons. And if you're using the the ground turmeric, as opposed to the fresh turmeric, you're gonna want three quarters of a tablespoon of the fresh turmeric. So if you've got your combined total, one and a half pounds of fresh ginger and fresh turmeric, you're going to need six lemons, and we're gonna use the entire lemon. And even if you're going with the dried spices, you still want six lemons. And the only other ingredient you're gonna need is some water. Once we get these ice cubes all made, then I'll talk about how to sweeten this beverage if that's something that you want to do and how to use the right type of sweetener so that it mixes very well. Now to prepare these ice cubes, the first thing we're going to do is start chopping up our fresh ginger and our fresh turmeric. Now, do you peel these or not? Both my fresh ginger and my fresh turmeric happen to be organic, so I'm not gonna worry about peeling them. If your fresh ginger is not organic and your fresh turmeric is not organic, it's really up to you whether you wanna peel them or not. Even though pesticides are going to be used on the fresh ginger and the fresh turmeric, the rhizomes, these are known as, <laughs> these are known as rhizomes, tend to not retain a lot of the pesticide. So that's just something you're gonna to have to think about and decide what you wanna do. Now I'm gonna put the lemons aside for a minute. We'll talk about those in a second. And in the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and start chopping this up. And there's real no science about this. This has, as I often say, this is not an exact science. Uh, you just wanna chop up, uh, you know, in about one inch type diameter coins, something like that. And you're going to want to make sure that you have some kind of soup pot ready. I think this is about uh, five quarts or so. Uh, but just something that will hold all of your fresh ingredients is how you want to gauge what size soup pot you're going to need. And I know many of you often ask me about this little stovetop uh, or countertop burner and do I like it, and so on and so forth. Yes, I like it very much. It's made by Cuisinart, and I'll be sure to put a link in the description below if you want to learn more about it. The only thing that I do find with this, it runs hot, so you do need to be a little careful. Medium to me is like high on this, but it's great uh, to have this extra burner, uh, especially for uh, water bath canning, because I'll show you this is a cast iron burner, so it's nice and strong. So this is the size that you're looking for. The reason that you're cutting it up like this is you just want to uh, provide a sufficient amount of surface area so that we can leach as much ginger into the water when we simmer this, because that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get all of this, except the lemon juice, we're gonna get everything else into our soup pot cover it with water, and then we're gonna let it simmer. So all of the wonderful properties, the anti-inflammatory properties, the antiviral properties, the antimicrobial properties, the antibacterial properties, everything will leach little by little into our warm simmering water. And as you slice this up, just go ahead and add it right into your soup pot. And I'll continue cutting up the ginger but I also want to show you how I'm going to cut up the turmeric. Just like the ginger, we're just going to cut, you know, one inch, oh, I'm flying, one inch pieces. And if you've never worked with turmeric before, it's very interesting. It actually looks like, it actually looks very much like a carrot when you slice it. Now, one thing I want to mention, 
as you're slicing your turmeric and handling it or if you're peeling it, it does release some of its color and it may stain your hands. But you can wash them and it'll fade very quickly. But if that type of thing bothers you, then by all means use some disposable gloves. And something I definitely think you'll find interesting if you've never worked with fresh turmeric before is the aroma that it releases. It has some, an aroma, something similar to ginger, but with, it's like more of an earthy aroma. It's very pleasant. Now, as you slice your turmeric, you may notice some variation in color, uh, but don't worry about that. It's all nutritious. It's just some that are larger and maybe a little more mature will be a little darker in orange color, and sometimes the smaller ones will be a little lighter in color, but they all still have wonderful anti-inflammatory properties. So I'm just gonna go ahead and finish chopping up my turmeric and my ginger. I'm going to get everything into this stock pot and then we'll move on to the next step. Well, I've got all of my sliced ginger and sliced turmeric in my soup pot. Now, if you're using the dry, just go ahead, measure them out with your tablespoon and go ahead and put that right into your soup pot. Now, because my lemon press is green, it made me think of a question you might have. Can you use limes instead of lemons? And yes, you can definitely use limes in place of lemons. And as a matter of fact, you can use any type of citrus. If you want, you can use oranges in this recipe, or you can even use grapefruits. The only difference is, is that if you go with limes, you're still going to use six. If they're exceptionally small, then you'll want to use eight. With oranges, you'll want to use four, and with grapefruits, you'll want to use two but I'll have all of this in the printable recipe. Now, whatever citrus I'm using in this recipe, I like to use the entire piece of citrus. I like to include the zest and the pith. Now, the juice we reserve and we add that after this has had a chance to cool so that we maximize the amount of vitamin C that we're able to capture. However, I wanna talk about the pith. Some people find the pith exceptionally bitter. However, the pith is also really nutritious, and I don't like to lose out on that nutrition. And after you've turned this into an iced tea or into a hot tea, you can add some sweetener to offset any bitter taste that may be associated with the pith. However, I find the process of slowly simmering all of the ingredients together, except for the juice, but including the pith, to soften the bitterness in the pith. So I highly recommend that you try this at least once with the pith. Now, we could just go ahead right now, cut these lemons in half, juice them, set the juice aside, and then throw the lemon halves that have been juiced right into our soup pot. However, I prefer to grate the zest first. I feel that again, just like with slicing the fresh ginger and the fresh turmeric into coin sizes, that by zesting these, we really help release as much of the essential oils in the citrus zest as possible. Now, if it's easy to do using a microplane, you certainly can do that. And that's the safest way to do it if you want to try to avoid as much pith as possible. If you're not so worried about the pith and you plan on throwing it in after we juice the lemons, uh, you can certainly use uh, the larger size of the grater. And if you get some pith in, it's not the end of the world. But sometimes it can just be easier using the microplane and talk about really being able to release essential oils. This is a wonderful tool to do that. And why are we using the zest? The reason is those citrus essential oils are also very rich in nutrients. And again, we don't want to miss out on those nutrients. And the nice thing about using the entire piece of citrus, nothing goes to waste because even after we simmer this and we turn these into ice cubes, I'm going to show you what to do with what's left over in your soup pot. So you're going to completely maximizing making the best use of all of this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is go ahead and use my microplane grater and zest all of this citrus. 
And you can just zest this right over your soup pot. Uh, if you find it easier, you can rest it like this, right onto the soup pot and then continue to zest. Or you can just put it down into your soup pot. I like this way because I find that it's very similar to if I was using uh, a four-sided grater like this. Uh, grater, <laughs> not a four-sided a fourth grater. <laughs> And then I'll just, let me move this out of the way, I'll just grate like this. I find this very easy to do. And the weight of being able to push down into the soup pot, and I'm actually just kind of resting on some of the ginger and turmeric so I don't scratch the bottom of my pot. But that's what I do, and I find it very easy, and I think the job goes pretty quickly. And then the, the zest will fall down into the pot, and then whatever remains on the other side of the grater, I just tap that down. Now the lemons that I'm using are organic, and so what to do if the lemons you have are not organic? I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would just give them a good scrub. You can use some uh, baking soda and vinegar mixture, and just do the best you can to clean them. Uh, yes, you're not going to be able to get off all the pesticides. However, I do think that there's so much benefit in the zest that it outweighs whatever amount and relatively small amount of uh, pesticide residue uh, may reside on the lemon. And the bottom line is, it is important to remember that although we often like to buy organic when we can, Organic doesn't mean pesticide-free either. It just means that the pesticides that are used on it may be more gentle, so to speak, for lack of a better word, as opposed to those that are used on crops that are called non-organic. And certainly those more tried and true, mild slash more tolerant pesticides, whatever you, uh, however you want to refer to them, are certainly easier, you know, on the farmers and their health. However, uh, it is important to know uh, that organic doesn't mean pesticide-free. I often see a lot of people at the grocery store talking to their children and saying, oh, you know, we buy organic because it has no pesticides. And I always, I don't chime in, it's none of my business. <laughs> but I always feel that, uh, it's just important to know the truth and understand. And uh, I'll definitely, in the corresponding blog post, I'll link to the website at the, I think, believe it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture that uh, here in the United States that shows uh, what pesticides are allowed to be used on organic crops. And it's just good to know. And also keep in mind that there's what's known as the Clean 15. And that's a very easy list to find uh, on the internet. All you have to do is type in Clean 15. And I'll also have a link to it uh, in the blog post uh, that corresponds with this video. Uh, but those are crops that are not organic, uh, but they are sprayed uh, with pesticides that are considered relatively mild and not particularly damaging uh, to one's health, the environment, so on and so forth. And that list, I think the actual, so many people have it uh, reprinted around the internet. I believe it's put out originally by the Environmental Working Group. And they have a lot of good information. And so uh, definitely check out their site uh, if you're interested in uh, crops that are grown, you know, without pesticides, and not without pesticides, but with more milder pesticides. And, you know, because even things that are organic, when they're big commercial farms, it would be hard for them to grow without something that can help, you know, control disease and insects and so on and so forth. But the uh, they have the Environmental Working Group also has uh, something they call the Dirty Dozen. And if you're exceptionally worried about pesticides, that's a good list to look at because those are crops that are sprayed with really strong pesticides and ones that have uh, a strong, if I'm using the right word, like a residual effect that it really clings to the food. Uh, so a lot of good information.
Well, I've got all six lemons zested, and now I'm gonna go and just cut them in half and prepare to juice them. And you can certainly juice these in any way you want. If you have an electric juicer, that's great. If you have the old fashioned one that you just go like this and twist it, that's great too. Uh, these are a lot of fun uh, to use and it's so tempting to put this in, to put the half cut lemon in like this. But what you're supposed to do is actually put it in like this. It seems counterintuitive. Uh, and then you squeeze it and it's really gonna juice it. Look at that. Oh, it does take a little elbow grease because it's gonna basically turn that lemon half like inside out. Then after you squeeze it, you know, like as much as you can, when you open it up, you'll see that it's like been turned inside out and it's really gotten a lot of juice out of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue juicing these with this little handheld juicer. Certainly if you're using oranges or grapefruits, those twisty type juicers can work very well too. They even have some handheld ones uh, that you can just put right into the center. I've used that type for years, very handy to have on hand when you want to hand juice citrus. But I'll go ahead and continue using this and get as much juice out of these as I can. Well, I've got all of my lemons juiced and depending on how juicy and not juicy your citrus is and depending on what type of citrus you use, you may get anywhere from three quarters of a cup of juice to over a cup of juice. Now my juice does have some of the pulp in it. The pulp does come through these holes and I'm fine with that. But when we, go, uh, when we get ready to add the juice in before we freeze these ice cubes, we can strain out the pulp. Uh, but I do like to leave it in. It's extra nutrition, it's fiber. Uh, and I enjoy having some of the pulp in the finished product, the iced tea or the hot tea. However, yes, you can strain out the pulp. So we're just gonna set our juice aside for a minute. Now I've got all of these uh, rinds, so to speak, that have been zested. Uh, now, if you don't want to add in the pith to uh, your soup pot, I do recommend that maybe you take a little time and just start peeling out uh, some of the flesh from the lemon. I mean, this all has nutrition and I would hate for it to go to waste. Now, as you do this, you may get a little bit of the pith. So it is up to you how you best want to handle this. However, I recommend the whole thing going in, but at least trying to take out some of this. See, some, some will come out very easily, just to, I guess depends on the lemon, and you can pull it off pretty easily without getting any pith. So what I'm gonna do is just take a minute uh, I'm actually gonna go <laughs> rinse my hands first so that they're not uh, all wet while I'm using this knife. But I'm just gonna go ahead and chop up all of this just to show you a little bit here what I'm gonna do. Then I'm gonna go rinse my hands. But I'm just gonna chop this into pieces similar to like what I did uh, with the ginger and the turmeric. Again, just trying to release as much of the nutrition from the pith as possible to provide as much open surface area as possible. Now I'm gonna use some bottled Texas spring water because I have it, but you can also use tap water for this, whether you have city water or well water, you can use whatever water you want. Now what I've done is get all that pith into there and I've just kind of stirred everything up and now we're gonna go add in our liquid. Now the reason that I'm measuring it is so, so that I can give you an exact amount that you'll need if you're using these dried spices. Under normal cir circumstances, I just fill to cover and I don't measure. Uh, basically, just about an inch or so above uh, all of the ingredients that I've got in the soup pot. And I've gotta tell you, speaking of all the ingredients, wait till you make this. The aroma, it's just heavenly. You know, my husband helps me uh, film these videos 
And every time he comes into the kitchen, he says, oh my gosh, that smells so good. So it not only smells good, the aroma is wonderful, the taste is fantastic too. Alrighty, well let's, oh gosh, I've got, I'm looking down, I got lemon on my apron. Alrighty, well let's go ahead and add in this water and I'll see how much I need to cover and then that'll give you a good estimate of how much you'll need if you're just using the dry spices. So I found that about six cups of the water worked perfectly to make sure that everything was covered. I can press on it and everything can still be, can be submerged under the liquid, under the water. Uh, so I think that's a good rule of thumb for you if you're making this with the dried spices. Add about six or so cups of water. Now what I like to do is bring this up to a boil, but watch it very carefully. The second it comes up to a boil, I like to immediately turn it down to the lowest setting I have on my stove, or in this case, on my portable cooktop. And which, in this isn't even one, it's called minimum. And I'm gonna turn it down as low as possible, and then I'm gonna put the lid on, and I'm gonna let it gently simmer for one hour. Well, just as this came up to a boil, I turned it down to my lowest setting. I'm just gonna give it a little stir here. And now I'm gonna go ahead and put the lid on and I'm just gonna let that simmer on this very low setting for about an hour. And after an hour, we'll come back, we'll strain it. I'll show you what to do in terms of making the ice cubes. And I'll also show you what to do with what remains in the soup pot. And even if you use the dry herbs, but you threw in the uh, pith, I'll show you what to do. Now I've had this simmering on low for about an hour. So I'm just gonna remove my lid for a second. And I wanna mention something about black pepper. Black pepper has an ingredient in it that makes the good ingredients in turmeric more absorbable by the body. Now, if you don't have black pepper, do not, do not absorb any of the nutrients from turmeric. No, you still uh, absorb some of the nutrients from turmeric, but the black pepper will help you absorb it even better, absorb them even better. And so if you want, at this point, you can put in a little black pepper which I'll go ahead and do. And really for this amount of liquid, no more than maybe an eighth or a quarter of a teaspoon. Uh, you know, it will give it a little, little bit of a kick, but you've got the kick from the ginger too. So I'm gonna stir in that black pepper and then I'm just gonna put the lid back on, leave it on that low heat and let it simmer for about five minutes. Well, I let this simmer for another five minutes now what I'm gonna do is turn off the heat and I'm gonna remove this lid. And then what we'll do is transfer this pot off of the heat. Now we're gonna to start to remove some of the solids, which I'll go ahead and put into this bowl and we'll reserve those for later. You'll see what we'll do with these. And I'm just using the spider strainer. If you've seen all my bone broth videos, you know I love this spider strainer. But if you don't have one of these, no problem. You can also use a slotted spoon or a small mesh strainer, whatever you've got. I'm just gonna let as much liquid drain off as I can. Alrighty, let me transfer that to the bowl and I'll just keep getting out these solids. And then once I get all of this out, uh, I'll show you what we're gonna do with the liquid. Alrighty, now that we've got all of our solids out of our liquid, we're gonna go ahead and put these aside. Don't throw them out. <laughs> and then we're gonna go ahead and get a bowl. I've just got this large measuring cup and a mesh strainer. You're gonna need a mesh strainer. And now what we're gonna do, you could certainly try to pick this up and pour it in, whatever works for you. I'm gonna use a ladle just to make the job a little easier. These cast iron pans are very heavy. And then I'm just gonna start ladling my liquid through the mesh strainer. And the reason that I'm using the mesh strainer 
is just to catch any little bits and bobs that maybe I didn't get when I was removing the solids. Now, there will be a lot of, you know, pulp and whatnot from, uh, especially from the lemons or the lemon rinds as they cooked, as they simmered. And you can decide exactly how much liquid you want to drain through and whether or not you want to work uh, like a spatula or a wooden spoon, whatever you have in the mesh strainer to get some of that pulp to work its way down. I like the pulp, so I am going to do that. But if you want something that really has very little pulp in it, then you won't, you'll just want to let this sit for a while and let as much liquid drain through it as possible and not work. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. You don't want to like work like this where you're getting the liquid to go down faster, but you're also pushing some of the pulp through, but I like to do that. Now I'm just going to keep working this through with my spatula, working the liquid through along with some of the pulp into uh, my measuring cup, working it through the mesh strainer. And I'm just going to keep doing this until I'm happy with the results that I feel I've gotten out as much liquid as possible. If you don't want to be pushing through any of this pulp, then just set it aside and let it drain. Well, I worked the liquid through my mesh strainer and I just have a little bit of very thick pulp and some pieces of the pepper and so on and so forth that are not going to go through the mesh strainer. And this is why I use the mesh strainer because I kind of want to collect all these little bits and bobs, but I'm not going to throw that out. I'm going to add this to our solid scraps uh, from that came from the soup pot. Now I'm going to set our scraps aside once again. And what we're going to do now is let this cool. And you should have, if you measure this out, you should have approximately four cups of liquid. Now, once this cools to room temperature, that's when we're going to go ahead and add in our lemon juice. And if you want to strain out the pulp, if when you were squeezing your lemons, uh, you got a lot of pulp, in whatever vessel you're using to collect the juice and you don't want that pulp in your ice cubes which then eventually will be in your beverage you can strain just put your mesh strainer back over your bowl and pour through that and that way all that pulp will be collected now what i would recommend <laughs> is don't throw out that pulp go ahead and add that to your your bowl of scraps here because they will go, the pulp will go to very good use, which you'll see. Alrighty, I think this is about room temperature. It's cooled a bit. And I'm going to go ahead and add in my lemon juice. And you're going to have, as I said, anywhere from three quarters of a cup to probably a little more than a cup, depending on which type of citrus you have. I think I've got, I've got about a cup of lemon juice. So I'm going to go ahead and add that right into my mixture. I'm just going to give this a good stir to make sure that the lemon juice is well distributed. Now all we're going to do is pour our mixture into some ice cube trays. Now I like this little contraption because it lets me put three ice cube trays, I close the box and I just put it right into my freezer. But any type of ice cube tray will work. And I also have these other little molds and they do have lids on them. They're kind of small in comparison to my ice cube tray, but technically I think they do call them ice cube trays. What I actually like to use these for because they are all silicone is like if you're making elderberry gummies or something like that, little squares. And they're not the little cute bear shapes, but I think it's okay for us adults. <laughs> but if you want, you can also use things like this if you have silicon molds. Now you can go ahead and depending if you've got this in a bowl, uh, you may want to just ladle it into your ice cube uh, trays. Since I've got the pitcher here, I'm going to go ahead and just pour this as carefully as possible into my little ice cube holders. 
So I've got one ice cube tray filled. So I'm going to carefully just slide this into my ice cube box. Now I'm just going to go ahead and continue filling the, the remaining ice cube trays. And then we'll see if we need uh, to use those little silicon ones as well. And don't worry, I try to do the best that I can, but it's not always as neat as I'd like it. Not Pinterest perfect. <laughs> But it's, so if it spills over a little, don't worry. It's not going to create any kind of problem when you need to release them. Now I'm going to go ahead and put my second ice cube tray into the box, and then I'll finish filling my third tray. Well, I've got all three ice cube trays full, so I'm going to close this up, and I'm going to pop this in the freezer, and then we'll fill these molds with what I have left. Now I'll just go ahead and fill these. They'll be little smaller ice cubes, but they'll work just as well. Well, I filled all of these up except one. <laughs> How about that? So these little lids work well, especially if you need to cap uh, any of your silicon molds. Now they don't click on, they don't click close like this one did. And they don't you know, click on the way some storage containers may. So if you have these, just be aware of that. You just have to be careful. They just make the plastic lid so that, you know, especially if you're making any kind of the gummies, the chews with elderberry syrup or, you know, whatever type you make, you can go ahead and stack these in the fridge, which is really nice because a lot of silicon molds, you know, are just the mold and they're cute. You know, they have nice shapes and sometimes they're just square like this, uh, but this allows you to go ahead and do like that and then put them in the fridge. And this fall, as we get closer, once the weather gets cooler and we're preparing more, you know, for fall and winter, I'll make some um, elderberry chews or various herbal chews and things like that uh, that help, you know, to have on hand during the winter. Let, you know, let me know if you'd like to see me make those because uh, I do enjoy, I enjoy making those with gelatin. Well, let me go pop these in the freezer and then I'll show you what we're going to do with our scraps. Now, while the ice cubes are freezing, we're going to work on these scraps. And what we want to do first is puree these into a pulp. And you can basically do this in any type of blender. I just have a regular blender here. Uh, if you have a, uh, like a high speed Vitamix, you know, one of those type of blenders, that'll work great too. Uh, you can even do this in a food processor. And please go ahead and do this even if the only thing you put into your soup pot was the lemon rinds. If you were using the powdered ginger and the powdered turmeric, you still can do what we're going to do next with just the lemon rinds. Now it's best to do this in two batches if you use the pound of ginger, the half pound of turmeric, and the six lemons. And so I've just filled my blender about halfway through and we can put in a little more. And now we're just going to go ahead and put this onto the actual blending machine. Now we're going to go ahead and add maybe about it, just start with maybe a half a cup of water and we'll see how much we need to get this to become a nice, kind of like a slurry. And I'm going to start on the low side uh, of my blender and work up to the high side. Alrighty, here we go. Now I went on to add the full cup and maybe then some of water to get this to really puree beautifully into this somewhat slurry mixture. And then periodically I had the little lid off and I was going down just very gingerly and careful on the top, mixing it a bit but being careful not to put my spatula down too low. I didn't want to hit the blades. But you could certainly stop the blender and then scrape down the sides, you know, whatever way you're comfortable until you get that vortex, you know, in the middle and you really get this blending nicely. Now you'll know this is done when you just create a lovely little slurry like this. And you may still see like a little, little bits of orange throughout. That's fine. Nothing to worry about. That's just the turmeric and little bits of it uh, that aren't completely pulverized, but there's no need to worry about that. Then what you're going to do is take this puree, the first batch, and transfer it into a bowl. 
Then after we get this batch out and into the bowl, we're just going to repeat the same thing we just did, but this time with the remainder of our scraps. Alrighty, I've got this second batch done and now I'm just going to go ahead and add this to my bowl. Now that we have our puree, we're going to take a baking sheet. I've got mine lined with parchment and we're going to smooth out this, pur this puree. It, it doesn't have to be super thin, but you don't want thick clumps either. Now when we get this all smoothed out on our parchment, uh, parchment paper, we're going to put this into the oven. Now I'm going to talk about the dehydrator in a minute, in a minute, but I know the oven is accessible to most folks. Now I've got this spread out fairly thin, tried to avoid having any clumps uh, throughout. Just do your best, don't worry, it's not, it doesn't need to be perfect. But now you're going to put this in your oven on its lowest setting. Now I know today most ovens only go as low as 170 degrees Fahrenheit, that's fine. If your oven goes to 200 degrees Fahrenheit and that's the lowest that it goes, that's fine too. The only difference is going to be monitoring how long it takes for this to completely dry to basically a crisp. If you have dehydrator sheets like the silicone ones or even the ones now they make that kind of have a little bit of an edge to them or you have those round uh, trays that go into the dehydrator that are made for making like fruit leather and things like that, you can use any of those to spread out your puree and then you can go ahead and put those into your dehydrator. And really there's some flexibility on the temperature, but uh, generally you can set it at about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the type of thing, as with so many things that are homemade like this and are sort of, you know, home remedies or immune boosting things that don't follow a very established recipe, it's difficult to, to tell you exactly how long it's going to take for this to dry. But so you want to put it into your oven, 170 or 200, and that's Fahrenheit, or into your de dehydrator about 125. And what I recommend is that periodically, every couple of hours, check it. If it's in an oven, you may want to just, you know, turn your uh, baking sheet, take it out, rotate it, put it back in. You also may have to do that with your dehydrator. It really depends. Every dehydrator is different in terms of how it circulates air, and sometimes one part of whatever you're dehydrating can dry a little faster than another part, and that can usually be easily rectified by pulling your tray out and rotating it. So what I recommend is just start checking it every few hours. In the oven, you can check it after about two or three hours. In the dehydrator, start to check it somewhere between four and five hours. Well, let's start drying this or dehydrating it, and then I'll show you what we're gonna do with it. I think you're gonna really be happy with what we can make by drying this. Now the mixture that we put in the ice cube trays has frozen beautifully, and I'll bring those ice cubes out in a minute, and I'll show you how to use them. But first, I want to show you how glorious this mixture dried. Well, I had this mixture drying in my oven for about six hours, and when I checked on it, it looked pretty well dried. Uh, but maybe it needed just a little bit more time. But I was heading off to bed, so I turned my oven off but kept the door closed, and come morning, it was perfect. This is exactly the consistency that you're looking for. It's really dry and ve you'll see very crisp. I'm gonna, sh I'm, I'll break this off. Sorry, I think the paper is very crunchy, but let me just show you how beautifully, look at this. Isn't this glorious? So look at the beautiful crisp, like crackers. And that's exactly what you're looking for very, very crisp that you can easily break apart, completely dry. And something that I have to tell you about this is that the aroma 
that is going to permeate through your home when you are drying this in the oven or in the dehydrator is absolutely glorious. It's lemony, gingery, it's just delightful. Now what we're gonna do is just break both of these. I had two trays worth of this mixture that I dried. And what we're gonna do is just break this up to, into a lot of little shards, and then we're gonna pulverize it. And you have many options for how to pulverize this. I'm gonna use my little spice grinder. If you've got a little mini chop, or if you have a full-size food processor, or a blender, a regular one, or a high-speed one, any of that'll work. If you don't have any of those things, you can still pulverize this. All you need to do is put it in a plastic bag or a paper bag, whichever you like, and get your rolling pin out uh, or a bottle or something like that and just roll back and forth until it turns into a powder. Then, once we get this pulverized into a powder, I'll show you what we're gonna do with it. Well, I've got some shards in my spice grinder and I'll go ahead now and just pulverize this. You wanna just get it to the point where it's a fine powder. Now this is the consistency that you're looking for, a nice finely ground powder. Next, what you're gonna do is start decanting this into some type of container. I just like to use a glass jar. I find using a funnel keeps things nice and neat. And if you want, this is not required, you can pour it through a little mesh strainer if you feel maybe there's a little chunk or something that didn't get completely pulverized. When you're using a spice grinder or a mini chop or a food processor or a blender, that's generally not a problem. If you are pulverizing this manually, there may be a little chunk here and there that your rolling pin or whatever you're using didn't quite uh, get it to a fine powder. And if so, using something like this can work very well just to get any little bits and bobs strained out. But what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and get this into my jar, and then I will pulverize all the rest of this. Now you may laugh when I say this, but this parchment paper smells so good. I don't have the heart to throw it out. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. But if you have any ideas, let me know. None of the coloring comes off on your hands and it just has this most amazing aroma. Yeah, so put some ideas in the comments. I think that this is one of the most fun household or kitchen, uh, I don't even wanna call it a chore because it smells, the aroma is just so good. I really like it. In any event, I want to show you, now you have this amazing ginger or lemon ginger turmeric powder. And this is a wonderful anti-inflammatory, basically supplement or addition that you can do a lot of different things with. One of which is you can go ahead and add this to a smoothie, or you can make a hot cup of tea with this, maybe when you're feeling a little under the weather, uh, just to kind of lift your spirits. The aroma alone is gonna lift your spirits. So I'll make a cup of tea and I'll show you, I'll put it in a glass teacup here, a glass mug, so you can see exactly how it dissolves. And what I love about this, you know, I don't like to waste anything. And what I love about using the scraps that we had left over after making uh, the anti-inflammatory mixture to make the ice cubes out of, that this is just so, uh, just a wonderful bonus, a wonderful surprise. And you know that if you go to a health food store or you have a health food aisle in your grocery store, powders like this that, you know, they say anti-inflammatory, turmeric powder, ginger powder, whatever, lemon powder, combination powder, these are very expensive. And look at, we're making it from something that was left over from another project that we're working on. While my tea kettle warms up the water, I'm gonna go ahead and take about a teaspoon of our lemon ginger turmeric powder here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in my cup. This is not an exact measurement, so you can use whatever amount you think might be appropriate. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and pour my hot water in here and let this dissolve. And just go ahead and give it a nice good stir to get everything to dissolve. And now we'll give this little taste. You could add a little uh, honey or whatever type of sweetener you like if you think that would help. 
Mmm. Oh, that's delicious. I wouldn't add any sweetener. And you know what? I think this is going to be so, it's just going to feel so good if you have a cold or a flu, drinking something warm like this with that kick of the ginger in it. Oh, I feel as my mother used to say, it's gonna open up the flanges. <laughs> You're gonna breathe better. This is really good. So definitely keep this on hand. Go ahead and put this in your pantry. A nice, cool, dark place will be perfect for it. You could even store it in a dark colored jar uh, or just put this into a paper bag uh, if you wanna make sure that you really are protecting it from light. You know, with anything like this, whenever you protect it from light, you always uh, maximize uh, saving the nutritional value of things like this. Uh, but and I, I've never put this in the refrigerator or tried freezing it, but that might be an option as well. But just having something like this to pop into a smoothie during these warm months or to enjoy as a hot cup of tea when things start cooling down or if we're feeling a little under the weather, I think this is terrific. Now our ice cubes have frozen up beautifully. I've got the little baby ones over here and then the regular size ones over here. Now, what I like to do with these is just store them in any kind of freezer-proof container. You could even just put them into a bag if you wanted. Uh, but now that they're frozen, you know, they're not gonna stick together. So I'll just go ahead. I'm gonna let this just warm up. I just took these out of the freezer. I'm just gonna let them warm up uh, for a second or two, it'll make it easier to get them out. And then what you can do with these, not unlike with our powder that we made, you can put a couple of these into a mug and then pour some hot water over it and, in, and the ice cubes will melt. It'll make the tea the perfect temperature to enjoy. And that can be a very soothing beverage, especially in the cooler months. And in the summer months, what you can do with it is get an ice glass like this, put a couple of these ice cubes in there, and then top it off with some seltzer, which is what we're going to do, and then we'll give it a taste. Now, if you wanna sweeten this, um, let me show you what to do, because you don't wanna just go ahead and put honey or maple syrup in there, especially it being a cold beverage. It's sometimes, if you've ever put honey uh, or some other type of liquid sweetener, uh, a natural one, into a very cold beverage, it sort of all just kind of congeals down at the bottom. And even if you use uh, like a sucanat, a granulated type whole sweetener, that's gonna have some trouble dissolving. If you've ever tried putting even white sugar into an iced tea, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna show you a little tip. So after just about a minute or two in the freezer, these will start <laughs> these will start to pop out. We've got one container here filled with our large ice cubes, our anti-inflammatory ice cubes, and we've got the small container here filled with the smaller ice cubes. Now, what I like to do, this is a lot of fun, especially if you like to serve mocktails. Basically cocktails, but without the alcohol. So they're very nice, especially if you don't drink or you have guests over who don't drink, but you're having a barbecue and you kind of want to make it festive. And at the same time, you're drinking something that's really nutritious as opposed to just a sweet soda or something like that. So you can just take a couple of ice cubes or oh, these are stuck together, that's perfect though. About four of the larger size work great. And then you take, you now you can use regular plain water by all means, but I think the, the carbonated water, if you have some kind of seltzer, that really works great. Now, what about sweetening it? That's what we wanna talk about. Now, these, and especially at a barbecue, these will start to melt relatively quickly and start to flavor uh, the seltzer, which is, it's, it's really a nice treat. You can always just drink plain seltzer. Uh, and if you've seen the flavored ones, sometimes are expensive, but whoops, but this you can make your own. And I have a, speaking of these types of things, I have a lot of recipes for mocktails and a lot of recipes for 
homemade sodas that are actually very rich in probiotics, good bacteria. So I'll be sure to leave all of those uh, links to all of those in the description underneath this video. But now let's talk about sweetening. If you just try to go ahead and put some honey or some maple syrup or sucanat in here, it's just going to pool on the bottom and the honey and the maple syrup may actually uh, because of the cold temperature of the beverage may uh, congeal. But if you turn those natural whole sweeteners into a simple syrup, it works beautifully. And I have a video where I show you how to make a simple syrup with whole natural sweeteners, uh, but it's very easy to do. It's really just a matter of personal preference in terms of the ratio that you want. Uh, but you want at least one part water to one part sweetener. So I've got one part water to one part honey in this one. Some people like to do two to one uh, to make your simple syrup a little sweeter. So one part water, two parts sweetener. But I go over all of this in detail uh, in my simple syrup video. So I'll be sure to link to that as well. But anyways, I'm going to go first. You know what? I'm just going to, the tea was so delicious. The hot tea from that mixture. I want to see how this is with just the ice cubes before we add any sweetener in. That's delicious. I really like it just as is. It's really pleasant and it's actually considerably more mild than the tea. This is the perfect mocktail and anybody who uh, is saying, oh, I have a little ache or pain, you can say, well, it's good. It's anti-inflammatory. But I'll go ahead and I'll add in a little bit of this simple syrup just to see how that affects the flavor. Mmm. That's nice too. It enhances it. It's just gorgeous. It's really flavorful. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Now, if you'd like more information on how to make a whole host of beverages like this, as well as those that are probiotic rich, as well as other anti-inflammatory foods, and also what I like to call immune boosting foods, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a whole playlist, including how to make an anti-inflammatory bone broth. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.